wonderful world of Disney. Ida, the offbeat eagle. And now your host, Walt Disney. On this program, we bring you the story of Ida, the offbeat eagle. All of us know that the eagle is a national bird of the United States. We see it on the backs of coins, on the fronts of buildings, on top of flagpoles, and in the center of the great seal. But did you know that it took six years to decide that an eagle would be the symbol on the great seal? Right after the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, a committee was appointed to select a design. John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. But you see, committees then were about like committees now. And the distinguished members couldn't reach an agreement. Benjamin Franklin, for instance, wanted the seal to feature a wild turkey. He said it was a respectable bird and a true native of America. Well, six years and several committees later, in 1782, the eagle design was finally selected. Of course, Ben Franklin was still talking turkey, but the committee, in effect, told Ben to go fly his kite. Anyway, the eagle on the great seal became the national bird. And strangely enough, while the image is everywhere, the bird is seldom seen and rarely recognized even then. Now, actually, there are two American eagles. The bald eagle and the golden eagle, which happens to be the subject of our story. Now, the eagle is master of the sky. Its spectacular flight is unmatched by anything in the world of man or nature. once sovereign of the skies above the northern half of all the earth. Today, the golden eagle rules only in small domains of wilderness. In the western United States, a remote stretch of the Snake River is such a kingdom. On this day, it was the queen bird that proclaimed again her royal right to take a tribute of food from the earth below. Her seven-foot wingspan carried her high above the rocky cliffs. Yet her incredible eyes easily found the ground squirrels below. In her hunting dive, she would exceed 120 miles an hour. Nature's decree that the golden eagle take her tribute wisely and only as needed. For this queen bird, the need was urgent. These canyon walls still wear the nests of countless vanished eagles, but now only one was occupied. The nest is called an eyrie. And in this castle in the crags lived one tiny princess with an enormous appetite. In the normal course of blessed events, the queen eagle hatches a prince as well as a princess. However, this lone eaglet was a little offbeat right from the beginning. She was the first hatched, and what with all the excitement, the second egg was crowded out of the nest. There was another member of the family, though. Now the kingbird announced his homecoming with a fine display of aerial prowess. He was inviting his mate to leave the nest. The queen would accept the offer. In the nursery, her mate would take over. 
and she welcomed the chance to stretch her wings. Each passing day meant another change as she made the transition from fuzz to feathers. And in the normal course of things, ten weeks and ten pounds later, she'd become a full-fledged eaglet. Then one day, square in the middle of her well-ordered life, fate dropped a whole tangle of trouble. the adult eagles were always away on the morning hunt, and the man was taking advantage of his opportunity. This was no place to contend with a pair of irate parents. The eaglet had never seen a human before, but she knew this wasn't her kind of folks. Say, hey, you're a big one. Take it easy. I'm not gonna hurt you. That's it. Cut it out! Actually, the invader was a naturalist, government employed, and banding birds was just one of his many jobs. Ouch! Relax. From these soft metal cliffs, man learns the migrating habits and lifespan of the eagles. Take it easy. We're finished. Her bird tag had a serial number and the letters IDA for the state of Idaho. There you are. That's the latest style. For the naturalist, it was just a good morning's work. For the eaglet, good riddance. For the bull snake, a good ledge for sunbathing. Of course, the naturalist couldn't tell a harmless snake by touch. So when he touched it, he tossed it. held the balance of power until she lost it. Now it's likely this was the first eagle ever that learned to swim before she learned to fly. And this was only the beginning. Next, her island of safety turned into a driftwood raft, and that really launched her career. maiden voyage spanned time and distance. The character of the land began to change, and by mid-afternoon, the river met the works of man. The eagle faced a problem. She was rapidly running out of wrath, and it looked like her journey would end on the brink of disaster. she had a choice. She could go down with a raft or up on her own.
dam keeper's assistant. Nature had given him one brown eye and one blue, but neither had ever seen anything like this before. swept under her wings and lifted her into flight. Then she caught an updraft, and it carried her above the cliffs. She experimented, unsteadily at first, but gaining balance and confidence, until at last she knew the wonder of her wings. It was her instinct now to return to the nest where she was born. But in this unfamiliar terrain, there was nothing to guide her. By sundown, she was hopelessly lost. She found the rim rocks of a foothill valley. Here, a long, trying day ended. Next morning, the eagle was full of ambition, but nothing else. She faced the immediate problem of finding breakfast. To her, smoke was movement. Movement was life. Life was food. And that was correct, up to a point. Only the food here was breakfast for one genuine 100% hermit, Uncle Billy Kipp. On his little ranch, the working day always began in exactly the same way, at exactly the same time. And Rufus was the official starter. Morning, Rufus. He never varied the ceremonial line of march that led to the high point of the day, a punctual, stirring rendition of the morning crow. warm up there. Now for the peak performance on the ridge pole. By now the eagle was just plain fed up with being hungry. It was time for action. And down below, it was time for the clarion call. Billy didn't know much about eagles and cared less. He'd handle this in a hurry. You nasty buzzard. Trying to kill my Rufus, huh? Then he saw the band. Now, if he recollected rightly, a bird wearing one of those gadgets was protected by the United States government. You government property bird. Well, law says you don't go around destroying government property. Guess I gotta do my American duty. Oh, 
shut up, you ungrateful buzzard. I ain't gonna hurt you. Get the hooks out of me! Oh, I did. Kind of a pretty name, because that's an ordinary cuss. So she was named Ida, just like it said on the band. Now, Uncle Billy's biscuits were case-hardened and dropped forged, but he did tie a good bandage. He'd done a bang-up job on that bunged-up wing, but he sure didn't know how to treat an eagle's stomach. You dang finicky to eat my biscuits, huh? Well, that proves you don't know nothing. Here, have a prime chunk of Edison, you high fool, buzzard. Hey! You nasty-tempered devil. You got me once already. Uncle Billy led a quiet, well-ordered life, and he wasn't about to let any gold-plated government buzzer disturb the peace around here. In his simple terms, there were only two kinds of living things. The critters, like his chickens, for instance, or the goats. And of course, the critters had to be protected from the varmints, the killers, like that Ida bird down there in the cabin. Well, for several days, the ranch operated on a sort of hit-or-miss schedule. Seems the time clock had a severe case of insecurity. Come on out here, you chicken-hearted rooster, and get your feet. Come right down to it, though. Maybe Rufus had the right idea. Nobody would rest easy around here until that eagle was healed up and headed for home. Listen to that. She's just itching to get out here and get her meat hooks into you chickens. safe either, Bula. Get off my chair. Come on, get Of course, it was typical of Ida. Even when she flew the coop, she walked. The question was, could she manage a takeoff? The billy goat came up with the answer. Well, her wing was working all right, but that test flight sure created a sensation in the barnyard. Gangway for Rupert. After my chickens, how you go play the government puzzle? You know, gut farmer, too? Get out of here! Go on! Hey, look out! Ida actually was obeying a defensive instinct. Anything that came flying toward her would be met with extended talons. And if she couldn't eat it, should just drop it. Well, what do you know? Old Fuss and Feathers wants to play. Catch this. Atta girl. Billy figured maybe he'd pass judgment too soon. Sure looked like she was just out for fun and enjoying the game. 
In spite of being a little sore-headed, Uncle Billy did feel reassured about Ida. There she was, free to go, but choosing to stay. Uncle Billy decided he'd take a chance, give her the run of the place for a while. Of course, that could be a little rough on Rufus. So he'd make sure she never got wanting for vittles. As time rolled by, Ida continued to become less of a problem and more of a pet. One game led to another. Uncle Billy soon discovered she was a wise bird for sure. No trick could keep her from the tree. just flipping a lid wasn't any challenge at all. So they moved on to more intellectual pursuits. Now Uncle Billy was a master at the shell game shuffle, but Ida beat him six times in straight sets. So you do that again, you overgrown coot. down to his last stake. Stop your peeking, you sneaking varmint. So far, he'd played it straight, but this was no time to be honest. He'd just bend the rules a little. Okay, this time I got you. Billy's fractured temper, but Ida was eager to go on with the game. She didn't know it was over. She'd found food under that hat before. Why not again? No! Come out here! Come out here with my hat, you thieving scoundrel! these days, Rufus had developed a bad case of coopophobia. Still, he never missed a morning crawl. But living under a handicap like he was, he tried to sneak it in before anybody was up. <laughs> well, the day was officially open now. But where was that smoke signal that said breakfast? Ida was getting impatient. Why are you ungrateful 
sleep wrecking hammerhead. I'll fix you. Saved by the bell. This was the day Uncle Billy had planned to go to town for winter supplies. He was pretty sure he could trust Ida now, but when he wasn't around, he figured to play it safe and keep her shut in for the day. Now, Uncle Billy had left her three square meals, but she had rounded them up into one good breakfast. She was hungry again before Uncle Billy finished his countdown and blasted off from the launching pad. <laughs> Now it so happened that high up in the rim rocks, an old Tom Cougar had been mighty interested in Uncle Billy's departure. This wasn't the first time he'd considered a raid on those goats down there, but the man's presence had always held him off. Now he sensed it was safe to move in. The old Cougar wasn't the hunter he used to be, but that didn't matter. Today he could take his time, take a goat, and take to the hills. I had heard the commotion in the corral, but it held no meaning for her. What she wanted was to get out and do some hunting. considered the little ranch her personal domain and now for the first time she saw the cougar a fierce instinct sent her driving down to defend her territory had his fill of one golden eagle, but he didn't get one smidgen of goat. Though Uncle Billy would never know it, the lives of his critters was Ida's farewell gift. Having disposed of the cougar, Ida began her search for food, and it carried her far from the ranch. By mid-morning, she still had found no game. And then, a flash of movement below. She'd conquered a cougar. Nabbing a rabbit ought to be easy. Well, nobody had ever told her she wasn't supposed to run him down. Half a mile of hedge hopping brought results. She spotted something she knew she could handle. She'd really hit the bottom of the Villa Fair and it only sharpened her appetite. As queen of the sky, she was entitled to a more royal menu. She continued to search for it. Up till now, Ida might still have gone back to the ranch. She hadn't yet reached the point of no return. But she had come to a turning point in her life.
this young show-off was the golden boy of the wide blue sky. He figured he was the big flap up here and a wing dinger. He wanted her to know it. for the grand finale. It'd give her a real pinion rattler. Ida was bewitched, bedazzled, and betrothed, all in a moment. Later on, they would mate. But first, in the manner of Golden Eagles, they would share a long engagement. Now the male eagle led the way into the air and called for his mate to follow. The male was a true high country eagle and it was to the tall peaks and early snows that he led Ida. For Ida it was a long trip on an empty stomach but her mate shook off her suggestion that they stop somewhere for lunch. Well, she was going to drop down and do some hunting. Let him stay on his straight-through schedule. Ida was good at finding game and going after it, but not much on getting it. wasn't even a match for a mouse. She hoped her blunder hadn't been noticed up there. But her mate had his own problem, a peregrine falcon. Half the eagle's size, but all fight and fury. And this was his private sky. battered and dazed now. The falcon swept in for the final strike. The ledge that saved the fallen eagle was well below the falcon's high domain. There would be no return. Not far away, Ida was flying to rejoin her mate. The cry led her to the ledge. In the male eagle's body, bone and muscle were bruised and torn. Ida sensed that she must hunt for both if they were to survive. In a gesture of cooperation, nature sent them a jackrabbit. And to Ida, at last, she gave the needed skill. So it was that Ida's first kill meant life for her mate. And she would continue to provide throughout the long period of healing. The big snows moved into the high country. Behind winter's curtain, Ida's mate would heal and grow strong again. It was on a day in spring that a new awareness stirred within the eagles. The time had come to find a nesting place.
this would be Ida's choice. The male would follow her lead. Journey's end. Ida had found the familiar cliffs above Uncle Billy's valley. It was here that her mate caught up with her. Somewhere among these rim rocks, they would settle down to housekeeping. Ida knew just what she was looking for, and she found it. Long before Uncle Billy's time, the golden eagles had vanished from these cliffs, but their iry nests remained. A little remodeling, and one of these would do. Her mate got the idea right away. Remodeling would be a cooperative effort, though. The male would supply the raw material, she would arrange the decor. In the course of their nest building, it was inevitable that the eagles would fly over Uncle Billy's ranch from time to time. And of course, he spotted them. He figured one of them might be Ida, but even so, she'd gone back to the wild and wasn't to be trusted anymore. It couldn't be a worse time for eagles, what with nannies dropping young'uns right and left. Of course, as long as they stayed close to home and mother, the kids would likely be safe enough. So Uncle Billy decided maybe he was worrying a little too soon. As it turned out, though, he was worrying a little too late because Nipper here already had plans for a breakout. He was the oldest kid and the biggest. For his first great adventure, he decided to climb that mountain just because it was there. But a lot of kids don't know that a mountain can be a big heap of trouble, and Nipper was one of them. Of course, Nipper hadn't been overlooked by the eagles, but they decided he was harmless and went on with their family affairs. Yeah. Nipper was only making conversation, but that's not the way Uncle Billy heard it. Yeah. Oh, don't tell me I've got a goat up in them rocks. The meat hungry eagle left. Billy was just an old spoil sport. After all, he'd only reached the first plateau. His heart was set on the summit. It was right about now that Nipper's high road to adventure turned into a dead-end trail to trouble.
thousand feet to the valley floor. Uncle Billy was hanging on the thin edge of eternity. Nipper's problem would have to wait now, and it might wait a long time. Up, down, or sideways, there just wasn't any way off this ledge. Maybe Uncle Billy wasn't so lucky after all. The long drop would have been a lot quicker. Late that afternoon, Ida took a break from her labors. Now she spotted something vaguely familiar down along the cliffs. She moved in for a closer look. Idea. There was a good chance his boot would snag among those rocks up there, but he just couldn't swing it around that overhang. Uncle Billy knew that had to be Ida, and she still remembered the old game. That gave Uncle Billy another idea. There was just a chance she might be his skyhook off of this ledge. drop, but Uncle Billy's luck just wouldn't hold. One good thing, though, Ida was still enjoying the game. Come on, Ida! Get that boot! hard for that boot. Let go, Ida. Good, let go. Just good and Ida, let go. When Uncle Billy won the tug of war, Lady Luck finally lined up on his side. Now Ida remembered she had a nest to finish and the time for games was over. of that afternoon, Uncle Billy did a lot of thinking about varmints, at least the eagle kind. He owed his life to Ida, and he wouldn't forget it. Put your bell on so I can get you. Come on up, you troublemaker. You're more trouble than you're worth. Well, the way Uncle Billy saw it, he could stop worrying now. As long as there was plenty of game in the valley, it wasn't likely those birds would ever bother his goats. As for Rufus... A little full coverage eagle insurance put him right back on the peak of his glory. 
In Uncle Billy's world, then, all was well. He had his piece of ground, his patch of sky. And to top it all, his own private spectacular. It was staged by Nature Daily, the aerial ballet of the Golden Eagle. there would be new life among the crags and young wings over the valley. And so in the end, a queen of the sky would fulfill her royal destiny. Well, that's the story, just the way Uncle Billy told it. Maybe it was a little offbeat, but if you've got any complaints, don't write us. You write to Uncle Billy Kip. His address is somewhere in Idaho. Bobcat. On the day the king of Wahoo Swamp came home, you could almost feel the hush that crept through every creek and backwater till there wasn't a sound or stirring anywhere. Of course, the gators were staying deep under to keep out of the noonday heat, 
But everything else had a better reason for lying low. If the king hadn't changed his ways, then right about now he'd be hungry and on the prowl. They called him the Wahoo Tiger. And in his prime, he was the biggest, toughest, meanest bobcat that ever ruled a swamp. He'd been gone almost seven years, driven out during the time of the big flood. But now at last, he'd come back to reclaim his kingdom. In the old days, he'd been hound-trailed and hunted by every human big enough to tote a gun. But no man had ever outsmarted him, or dog either. Of course, that was in his prime. Now the tiger was 14 years old. He was just beginning to find it out. His speed wasn't what it used to be. It was getting to be a chore just finding food, let alone catching it. Old age hadn't dulled the tiger's sense of smell, though. And right about now, he caught the scent of possum on the air. were getting a mite rusty. He'd just have to look farther down on the swamp menu. When the tiger finally did find something, he'd sure reached the bottom of the bill of fare. A plain old yeller rat snake. This was a little better than nothing, but not much. Tiger had caught himself a meal, all right, but now he wasn't going to get a chance to eat it. He'd laid down a mighty bold trail, and already trouble was dogging his tracks. The hound was an old enemy called Rattler. The man was Sam Baker. Caught off guard, the tiger didn't have much of a lead. But maybe with a little artful dodging, he could improve it. The tiger knew every inch of the swamp. He sensed he was being driven into a double-barrel dilemma. Caught in that open water, he was sure to get blasted. If he remembered rightly, in that old shack, another shotgun was waiting. Now, the best way out of a squeeze is right through the middle. He'd have to take a chance and try a trick. The tiger figured to leave his scent on this fallen tree, then back off and bring the hound to a dead end. didn't work out quite that way. Well, one thing, there was nothing wrong with the tiger's memory. He was looking at just about the best bobcat hunter in the business. Didn't make any difference, though. He had to have a place to hide right now.
some cat hound you are, he lost you good. Jed? Hey, Jed? That old cat's come back. The Wahoo Tiger. Fishing, likely. Trail's cold. Come on, Jack. Now, maybe Sam Baker hadn't noticed it yet, but old Jed Morgan had changed with the passing years. He'd finally come to realize that taking life wasn't nearly as important as hanging on to it. Pretty close call, Cap. Time passed. Sam Baker, that dog of his, couldn't have got within a mile of you. I'd say you ain't surprised you used to be. Yep, it's me, old Jed Morgan. Sure ain't lost your gumption, have you? Appears to me, old timey, you look kind of peaked. How about it, cat? You hungry? Go on, it's yours. I got plenty more. Well, Jed never thought he'd see the day. The king of the swamp, down to taking handouts. Better keep on going, Cap. You ain't king around here no more. Well, now, that was a matter of opinion. The old king cat figured he'd had quite a royal day. Outsmarted a hound and a hunter, come away with a banquet to boot. Tiger should have known. It always happens. Just when you settle down to enjoy your dinner, the neighbors drop in. Pretty unsociable neighbors, too. A herd of razorback hogs. Now, cats and hogs have a healthy respect for each other's fighting ability. But when they started saber rattling and making war talk, he knew he was in for a fight. that broke off the hostility. There was still plenty of tiger in the old bobcat yet. It is shortly after supper that dusk and drowsiness settled over the old cat. He slicked himself up a bit ready for a good night's rest, while all around him the swamp critters started tuning up for their nightly serenade. Since food finding was always a problem, he figured he'd get an early start. At 
this time of day, the best hunting was down along the waterways where the swamp critters came to drink. For the tiger, this was one morning that almost ended before it began. A cottonmouth moccasin. Now the tiger was in deep trouble. This was the private pond of old Boomer. keeper to a bobcat was something Jed hadn't bargained for. But that's the way it seemed to be turning out. Cat, you sure ain't got the good sense I thought you had playing tag with the gator. Now, if you ain't gonna take my advice and get out of this swamp, you better start acting your age and well, you might live a little longer. Here. That's a keeper from messing around with Sam Baker's chicken. Now, if you get hungry, you come to me for a handout, you hear? Well, seemed there just was no way for the tiger to get an easy meal. Still, he figured that fish was his, and he meant to get it back. Asking him politely, of course. But the skunk wasn't a bit polite about giving it to him. <laughs> perfume would mark the tiger wherever he went and make hunting just twice as hard. By evening, he was downright starved. He just had to take a chance. He remembered he'd found food here. Maybe he would again. In spite of his natural fear of man, he set out to do a little prospecting. There was no sign of the man, but from inside the shack there came a mighty inviting aroma. Now the tiger had never done any indoor hunting before, so he'd go a little light-footed till he saw what he was getting into. even anyhow. Because right now his eyes found what his nose had told him was here. Now the mouse of the house figured he had squatter's rights here. But if that cat was moving in, then he was fixing to move out. like the cat was just a little short on the jump. So while he was figuring a way up, this looked like a mighty good time for the mouse to be figuring a way down.
It was just when the tiger was coming in on the beam to the bacon that Jed Morgan was heading for home. The only one that wasn't making any progress was the mouse. Jed was beginning to wonder, what in tarnation? Inside, the cat was looking for a new trail to the bacon. And the mouse? Well, he was finally making a happy departure. But it was going to be a sorry homecoming for Jed. Jeez, what's going on here? Got me a pole cat for sure. Here again, I'll give him a dusting. Long after dark, the air still hung heavy inside the shack. It was just barely livable on the veranda. But already Jed's grudge was beginning to slip a little. He knew every instinct must have told the cat to stay clear of humans. Why the tiger'd have to be nearly starved to do what he did. Yeah, well, the old fool's all that hungry. Of course, forgiveness can go only so far. Considering the tiger's aromatic state, Jed decided to let him do his eating out in the open, kind of far away and downwind. to the house cleaning in the morning. It was still pretty fierce in there. His dreams would be a lot sweeter out here in the fresh air. Cat, I never thought you'd have the crust. <laughs> All right, eat good. 
Now, maybe it's a good thing the tiger finished up and moved out when he did. too much attention to swamp gossip, but this time he would have been real interested to hear the news. There was a stranger in the swamp, a big burly bobcat called Lop Ear. He was moving into the Wahoo, looking for a new hunting territory. So far, he'd found everything to his liking. He was figuring to stay. Straggling along behind came the rest of the family group, his mate and their two kittens. The kittens liked it here, too. Of course, all they really wanted was just plenty of romping room for their favorite game, Leap Cat. looked like two of a kind, but that's where it stopped. One favored staying close to mother, and the other was more the explorer type. And right now, his kitten heart was set on high adventure. Like all youngsters, the kitten was long on curiosity and short on caution. Of course, he really didn't know what he was looking for. But he had a pretty good idea that this wasn't it. Time to head for home and mother. The shortcut was straight up. that kitten. And the kitten didn't wait to explain. But when Lop Ear strolled over to investigate the yowling, this was something the tiger could understand. In this kingdom, there was room for only one king.
so in the end, old Boomer played the unexpected role of peacemaker. It was a three-way standoff. Aside from that one day of destruction, Jed and the tiger always treated each other with mutual respect. Each kept his distance. So Jed was more than a mite surprised when one day the tiger made the first move toward a closer friendship. Hello, Cap. <laughs> Hope you ain't run across any polecats lately. <laughs> Hey, don't you know you're a varmint? You can't go playing around like a house cat. Okay, you've had your fun. <laughs> Give me back my line. Got yourself all tangled up, eh? <laughs> hey, cut it out. You're chewing up my best line. I know what you want. They weren't biting today. You gotta go somewhere else for your supper. Well, they make sure it ain't Sam Baker's. It was the right advice, but wasted on the wrong cat. That night, a real outlaw prowled the swamp. In human terms, at least, Lop Ear was a bad cat. He always did his hunting the easy way a dedicated killer of domestic livestock. And chickens were his specialty. shotgun was something else. He didn't have much choice. And now, he didn't have much chance either. Sam's mind at all. He had just seen the king go down. You there, Jed? Hi, Sam. Jed, you'll never believe it. No? I finally got him. Well, you did, huh? Got who? The old Wahoo Tiger. Stole one of my chickens last night. The Tiger? Sam, you... You got the Wahoo Tiger? Well, I didn't get him exactly. Alligator did. But I saw him go under. 
Bet you didn't even know he was back. You hear something? Hear what? That. Something around back. A squirrel, most likely. Well, I'll be. Guess I got the wrong cat. Sam, it wasn't the tiger been stealing your chickens. I've been keeping tabs on him. Then you did know he was back. Well, yes, I and did. How come he's hanging around this shack? Uh, Sam, I can explain that. Oh, Sam, listen to me, will you? Hold it a minute. Don't get so excited. Jed. Jed, you gone simple setting out vittles for that varmint? It's only because he ain't up to chasing rabbits anymore. He's getting old, Sam. Real old. Yeah, I know. Like you. That's it, ain't it, Jed? Old timers stick together. Well, you go right on looking after the varmints around here. Me, I'm going to look after my chickens. And I'm going to get that cat if it's the last thing I do. You'll never get him with that dumb hound of yours. That cat's too smart. He ain't too smart for Brother Harry's dogs. The best hounds in the state, and you know it. Sam Baker didn't waste any time. Just two days later, he made good his threat. <coughs> Sam knew every inch of the swamp. He soon gave Brother Harry's hounds something to work on. Hold it, right here. Cat signed, right here. Get them started, Harry. We'll see how smart that cat is. <coughs> Boy, they've got it already. Picked it up right away. About a quarter of a mile away, the two kittens had planted themselves plumb center in the path of trouble. downright terrifying. Mama's boy was already headed for home. And when you suddenly find yourself out on a limb with no place to go, it's no disgrace to back down. Now these two gadabouts had laid down a regular road map of kitten trails. The hounds picked up one and followed it right to the lookout tree. While they were trying to unravel the tangle, there was big game just a few hundred yards away. The tiger. He figured it was time to move out. <laughs> Gabe, the leader, just happened to catch sight of the tiger's tail. The kittens just couldn't find Mama anywhere. So they decided to hole up and hide out. Turned out they'd found a box seat for the big chase. Get. Of course, the mother cat had been frantically searching for her lost kittens. And now, with that pack of hounds on the loose, she made the right decision. While they had the chance, she would take her kittens and leave the Wahoo Swamp forever. Meantime, the tiger was just kind of loafing along, well out in front of the pack. But the hounds weren't loafing, they were closing fast. 
The old bobcat wasn't worried, though. He hadn't even opened his bag of tricks. Come to think of it, though, might be a good time to try one right now. He'd lay a trail halfway up this tree, backtrack on it, then just walk away and leave it hanging there. It always worked before, and it would have worked again, except for two things, Gabe's sharp eye and a slow getaway. Well, it's just call for trick number two. Wasn't the first time he'd sunk his tracks under six inches of swamp water. Uh-oh. That scared-up heron was a dead giveaway. Sure enough, Gabe picked up the sign and traced it straight back to the tiger. something quick, something special. He'd bust right through that herd of razorbacks and lose his scent in theirs. Tiger had a pretty good lead. But now the hounds gathered their senses and were off and running again. The old cat had bought himself a little time, but it was fast running out. The Wahoo Tiger had just about reached the end of his last trail. So maybe it was a kindly fate that brought him to the one place where he could hope for help. Jed Morgan's favorite fishing spot. The hunting call of the pack. The cry of the cat told Jed his old friend was in deep trouble. But where was he? If he ever got caught in that cypress grove, he'd never come out alive. That you, Cat? Well, at least he'd found him. Now what to do? Wait a minute. That island. There was an idea. If he could only make it work. Come on, Cat. Come on. How about a fish? See this fish here? Like a nice fish? I'll leave it right here for you. You come and get it. Well, it was up to the tiger now. Would he trust Papa. the man? Or take his chances with the hounds? It had to be this way. That's a good cat. Now. Take it easy. Hold it. Now. 
Hold your horses now. Just a second. The first part of Jed's plan was a little detour till the course was clear ahead. Stay still. Stay still. We better split up, Sam. Come on. Come on. Here, here. Here again. Lightning. Come on, boy. Come on. Here. Tiger, now's the time. Take it easy. Now leave it to Jed. You sure act if you were in a hurry to get out to that island. Yeah. <laughs> With your help, Cat, we'll sure outsmart that Sam fella. <laughs> dogs here. Plenty to eat. Rabbits, frogs, and maybe once in a while I'll stop by and leave you some catfish. Just for variety. Hey, cat. We may be getting old, but we still got it up here, huh? So long, cat. Be seeing you. The day wasn't quite over for Jed. Jed! It was back on the mainland. Sam Baker was looking for a little help, too. We lost the cat again. How about a ride to the other side? Sure, I'll take you across. The dogs took off that way. Harry went back for the truck. Couldn't have saw what I thought I saw, could have? Saw what, Sam? Bobcats. Bobcats? Twice while we were rowing by, I could have swore I saw a bobcat on that island. On that island? How could a bobcat get out there? If he knew how to row a boat, I guess he could make it. Yes, Sam, it's him. Okay, that's what I thought. But he's such an old cat, Sam. It's all right with me, Jed, as long as he stays there. Well, I'll get him to promise he won't roll back. Okay, <laughs> you do that. He'll stay there. I'll guarantee that. That's a mighty smart bobcat. Yes, sir, mighty smart. And so the old king had a new kingdom. Maybe not as big as the one he had before, but just big enough for the Wahoo Bobcat. And here he would live in peace to the end of his days.